the creative mornings, the first of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it's almost the end of January already. I cannot get over that, but that's fine. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Tōrua ki ngā mate haere 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 atu rā. E mihi ana te mana whenua o ngā te toa me taranaki whānui. Ki a tāpō e tau nei kia ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, tantō. Draw. So, I'm very excited that we have such a big crowd today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was looking up in the stats um, earlier and it, we haven't had uh, registrations of this size um, for over a year and a half. So well done to you folks for getting up. Maybe it's a new, new year, new me, new January thing, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a promise of donuts. Thank you, me. I'm not sure. But regardless, you're here and I love it. So our well, actually, before I start, who has never been to a Creative Mornings before? Good job, everyone. I love it. Thank you for joining us today. I hope it's enjoyable for you. So each, for those of you who have never been here before, uh, each month we get a global theme um, chosen by one of our chapters from around the world. There's about 16, 7, 69 chapters around the world. Um, more and more. Oh, my goodness. But the chapter, um, sorry, the theme for this month is rice. So I've got a little spiel that I'll read out really quickly. The sun must set before it can rise. So remember, every setback can be overcome. Each new challenge compels us to tap into our reservoirs of hope and determination. To live a fulfilling life, we must not wallow, we must rise. The phoenix rising from the ashes is such a juicy metaphor the mystical bird's fiery demise symbolizes the destruction of old expectations and how it's always and how it's always been done. Every creative act is a transformation. Each new project is a rebirth. We rise from everything that came before. That's why rise up is a rally cry for the oppressed. But we should all be shouting because our personal and collective empowerment are intricately linked. The rise of different voices creates a rich and more vibrant society. The goal is not reaching the top, it's lifting each other up. Together, we rise higher. There's the stats I wanted to show you that we talked about before. 69 countries around the world have creative mornings. There are 238, now I got that so wrong, 238 <laughs> chapters in different cities around the world. Um, someone said to me before that they signed up first for Vancouver. Who was that? Here we go, <laughs> Vancouver creative morning, amazing. Um, shout out to our wonderful helpers and sponsors, um, All Good for Oat Milk 257 for this gorgeous venue. Um, if you haven't been here before, come check it out during the day when it's a co-working space. Um, Sarah on photography is roaming around the beautiful yellow pants today. Um, hi, Peter Tabor. Andy's not here today, but we do have um, Ethan who's filming today. Woo! 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 Thank you. <laughs> Energy, guys. Um, Libertine blends for our tea, coffee supreme for the amazing caffeination, um, and Tiffany's water, six and twelve peanut butter, um, Nada Bakery for our um, gluten free loaf. <laughs> Nada Bakery is my local out there in Tawa. Um, Color Crafts for the labels, um, Bad Baker for our cookies, a special today, Dough Bakery for our beautiful bread and donuts. And six barrel soda for our speaker show. Uh, shout out to the amazing <laughs> volunteers that come here super early and help me set up and make you breakfast and make you coffee and all of that. There's there's one of them coming in. She's <laughs> <laughs> um, If you'd like to be part of our volunteer team um, on an ongoing basis or part of one off or whatever works for you, um, come chat after the session or pick us an email or DM us on Instagram. Um, we'd love to have your help. You can follow us on things if social media is your jam. And we've got a hashtag, apparently. Hashtag Creative Mornings and hashtag CM Rise for this month for the month of January. Oh, it's hot. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest today, um, Mia Tracy of Doe Bakery and Tikua Kai. Um, to give you a little bit of context, 
I thought it was real funny because bread rice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but also, I went to a wonderful bread making workshop um, out at Dove HQ, and Tim, who's uh, Mia's husband, told me their story, the story of Bo Bakery, and it really resonated with the theme of rice. So I hand it over to Mia. Round of applause. <laughs> Okay, oh, no. hello everyone. My name is Mia. Um, I am the one half of uh, Dove Bakery and Pickle and Pie. I'm excited to be here. I feel the theme of Rise um, talking about us is super generous theme where um, anyone that knows about hospitality will know that just surviving this last, these last two years is an achievement, let alone rising. So, um, yeah, I feel that that when you said, you know, you're a business that's been growing, and I actually had to step back and take a, a look and say, you know, actually, we, we kind of did. We kind of did <laughs> manage to get through and go us a little bit. Um, so this is our story. Uh, I'm very honest. I do a little bit of swearing. I'm also 14 weeks pregnant, so I also forget. Um, <laughs> so if we get through a sentence, and I'm just like, what was that word? Um, so anyway. Fight up more than you can chew, and chew like fuck, is a saying or a quote from Jeff Ross, who started 40 Ship Below. And back in the heyday, it was like something that Tim and I lived by, um, which I've now learnt in my older years. Um, that's great for hustle, but shit, that is not sustainable. Um, it got us going, but I don't know if I would recommend that to anyone. Um, so, pickle and pie. How do those look big? Hmm, not great. Sorry, Leon, <laughs> the graphic um, um, Pickle and Pie started back in 2017. Tim has always been a chef, and uh, we knew that, well, I mean, you guys know chefing in New Zealand has negative perceptions for shitty hours, shitty pay, you know, working a lot and not getting a heap of um, time off. And so we thought, you know, if we're ever going to be able to control our lifestyle, we need to do something for ourselves so that he's not always working for the man, um, which is so silly because when, once you own your own business, there's no such thing as like time off or <laughs> <laughs> annual leave. But you know, you do you do get some of the goods. So, um, so we started pickle and pie. Um, it started because. I was working at Cleminger, which is an advertising agency at the time, and Tim would come and visit me on my days off, which was usually uh, on his days off, which was usually a Monday or Tuesday, um, and he'd just been working all weekend eating chefy food, and he never felt like, you know, like big elaborate lunches um, or like he just wanted a basic, well-executed, delicious sandwich. And back in 2017. God forbid you couldn't find that in Wellington. Um, you can now. But anyway, so we're like, why don't we open a sandwich shop? So that's how that started. We started researching, okay, who does the best sandwiches? Um, well, it's got to be the Americans, you know, New York City, think like Katz's Deli, um, Reuben Sandwiches. So we're like, okay, cool. Let's um, go and open something that sells Reuben Sandwiches. Um, we'll call it like a Wellington take on a New York Deli, and we'll make our own pickles. So we did. Um, and then we thought, okay, if we're going to do an American deli style, we'll have to make whole, you know, like sweet pies, like lemon meringue and pumpkin pie, apple pie. And we started telling people, we're opening this place, it's called Pickle and Pie. And Joe Bloggs and um, our friends and, you know, New Zealanders, they're like, Pickle and Pie, cool, so you're going to do steak and cheese pies. Yeah. We're like, no, 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 <laughs> it's an it's a, um, American deli. They're like, no, you've got to do steak and cheese pies or like meat pies. <laughs> so I was like, oh, New Zealand, um, why don't you just let someone do like their niche? And actually I've learned that you just, you can't always push against it because the people want what they want and you just got to give them a little bit of what they want. And that's when we learned that actually meat pies and pickles, they go together. Um, so we found a space. Um, we brought, we signed a lease on, um, based on artistic drawings and architectural plans and knowing what I know now that we have six different landlords, six different sites, um, I would have negotiated so much harder. So 
never roll over if you've got a concept that you think is going to add to the city's vibrancy or the landlord's portfolio. You can negotiate hard, and we didn't. But anyway, this is what it looked like when we opened. Um, actually, it was slightly worse. There were um, there were like barriers around it, and all because the council hadn't ordered the um, pavers outside on time. So. But you know we were running out of time and we were starting to have to pay the rent, so we just opened our doors. Remember that, Elsie? <laughs> yes. Um, I didn't know this was going to be recorded, and um, I would not have put this photo up. But anyway, <laughs> I said I would give you the warts and all, and uh, this is a very unflattering photo, and it just shows how, like this was us two days before we opened. We were so tired. We worked so hard to get this place open, and actually. We didn't, well, I didn't know anything. Like, I had a background in hospitality, but, you know, it was on, it was working in, like, private functions and crew, um, super yachts and old school cafes where you use pen and paper. And I was focusing on the stupid shit, like, are these water glasses nice? And, like, what seat should we choose instead of the, like, the systems and the processes and all of that? And, like, you know, I would change the design of Pickle, knowing what I know now. But anyway. We also had um, two business partners at the time who we have grown to um, despise. They are not our partners <laughs> anymore. Um, and I got told, because one of them was a leadership coach and, and they wanted to be in charge of the hiring of the people, um, I got told to let go and, you know, don't, don't, um, don't worry about trying to be on top of everything and you know we'll hire the front of house manager and I was like okay fine whatever I'll just stop being a control freak and um, the night before we opened I was talking to this new front of house manager and I found out that they had actually had no experience in hospitality and instead had experience in construction and I was like what the and then <laughs> I was working at Clemenger at the time and I'd just taken two weeks off to do the um, the finish off the construction and then get the doors open and have basically spent that whole time training the front of house manager about hospitality and I, it wasn't my finest moment because you know there was no time and it was a bit of a dictatorship and anyway it's okay to be a control freak two days before you open your own business is what I learned there um, but then it worked and Tim was working 80 hour, day, 80 hour weeks and it was totally fine because you know we had that con consistent oversight of our place. We had queues out the door on a Saturday, which is totally not stressful because you've got people coming in and that's the best thing. And then I, um, I'm not being sarcastic. That is like, you know, when, <laughs> when there are no queues, that's bloody stressful. Um, and then I started researching about how pickles and like the nutritional information and like how do you wholesale something, you know, g getting into barcodes and all of that stuff. And I went to more Wilson's and I did a sales pitch to them, and then we, we now stock in more Wilsons as well as many, many places nationwide, Far Refresh in um, Auckland. And it was cool. We were like, yeah, this is working. Um, and then, <laughs> and then we had just, I remember precisely, we had ordered a huge amount of meat um, because we were going to do this huge big pie production. The chillers were full um, and then we went and we got told that in two days we were going into lockdown, which like this was like thousands of dollars of stock in our fridges and we were ringing up everyone like in the industry, hey, can we borrow your freezers, what can we do? And I was like selling off all these pies to people saying we're going into lockdown, like buy pies for your, for your freezers and I just... We'd, I think we had 15 team at the time, and that was just so stressful. Um, and then we went into lockdown. Thankfully, I was still working at Cleminger. Um, and Tim was cooking 24-7 because he was a chef and he was bored and I needed feeding. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was great. Um, and he started making bread like everyone else. And um, we had, unlike... I feel, I feel a bit mean saying this, but we had um, trade accounts, so we just changed our delivery address and we said, can you send us 20 kg bags of flour while <laughs> people were lining up at the supermarket to get their like, little ones and they were... Anyway, 
So Tan started baking. He's like, I'm going to bake bread. Um, his first attempt at bagels looked like cat's bum holes. Um, <laughs> but it started, and he goes, I know this one on the right here. I'm going to perfect the, um, the rye that we should be using at Pickle, because at this time we were uh, ordering from another supplier. So he did it. And um, then we looked at the money that we spend at Pickle on bread. And he goes, we should just start making our own. So we sent all of our chefs 20 kg bags of flour. And we said, you guys are at home. Um, <laughs> you're bored. Just start, start baking these recipes. And by the time we got back to Pickle, all of our chefs knew how to bake our bread. And we just started baking in-house. Um, and then we, I think it was, what do you call it, level three lockdown or whatever. And you could order takeaways, contactless deliver. Um, pickups and that sort of thing. And so we started, we opened up Pickle again and there was no one. There was, like, there was no one because no one was working in the city. And you know, we'd be lucky to turn over a couple of hundred dollars a day. And we had, I think at that time, we had to start paying our team again from the business. Um, and it was really stressful. And then my mum had this, she's a florist, and she had this little green caravan which she used to sell flowers out of at the market. So we bought it off her. We put a coffee machine in and we put a toasty pie, like a grill and a pie warmer, and we started selling pickle and pie for like as a pop-up out in Silverstream in Upper Hutt. And then we started getting queues down the street and we're like, oh, maybe this will stay for a bit. So we rebranded it and we got a food truck. And this was doing three times the revenue that pickle and pie in Wellington was doing. <laughs> But Wellington obviously had exorbitant rent to cover. So anyway, the queues started happening and um, the mayor of Upper Hutt, Wayne Guppy, bless him, <laughs> sent, um, <laughs> sent the director of the gallery, the local ga gallery, Fidunaki down, and they were looking for a tenant for the cafe space. So go down and see those people with the queues and say, can you put pickle and pie in, in the gallery? I said, God, no, no, we are not opening something in Upper Hutt. Um, I spent half my life trying to get out of here where I'm from. <laughs> and, um, and I actually worked in that very space when I was 14. I was like, I'm not going back. <laughs> and so there's that saying, you know, cut off your nose to spite your face. The rent was really good. I knew you know, a thing or two about negotiating with landlords. And um, by this stage, we knew that the bread that we'd started making in-house at Pickle and Pie was going to take over our tiny, tiny fridge. So we opened Dough Bakery. Um, we said, we looked, there was actually a bigger kitchen as part of the lease, and we're like, why don't we just take over that, we'll start a bakery, we'll sell bread to ourselves at Pickle and Pie, and then we eventually we'll start wholesaling it. Um, it's cheap rent, you know, what, what have we got to lose? And also, you know, I keep saying, I say silly things like, I hate Upper Hutt, you know, it's so ugly and no coffee, there's no like, there's nowhere decent to eat. And we thought, why do we can keep complaining about this, but we're not going to do anything to change it? <laughs> so we thought, okay, let's, let's do something, let's, let's change it, let's put our best foot forward. Um, and then we opened, and this is a totally random photo um, of a shoot that I was on when I was working at Clem and Jack, because it's to, I didn't learn. <laughs> it's to say I didn't learn. When we opened Pickle and Pie, I took two weeks annual leave. And when we opened Doe, I was on a night shoot filming a drunk driving ad, which went, a night shoot you film like through the night. And it was five nights in a row. And it was, I think we wrapped at four o'clock in the morning. I got back to the hotel and then my flight was at 10. And then I went back to Wellington and I started hanging wallpaper at Doe. Do not do that because <laughs> I don't know why I didn't learn. Like there's still mistakes in Doe that I can't see past. And like if you're going to invest your time and money into something, just bloody invest your time and money into it. Anyway, it's a great shirt. It's a good ad too. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> um, and yeah, things were going really well at Doe. Pa you know, COVID was kind of gone and People, the, the public had money again and they wanted to, you know, spend it and do things and go out and see people. And then we went back into lockdown. And I think at this stage I was four or five months pregnant. Again, I didn't learn. Um, but <laughs> the, um, 
<laughs> overnight. I think like we were in lockdown and then the government decided, okay, you're going to be able to do deliveries or contactless deliveries if you're a, a business that, you know, meets XYZ. So overnight we made a, a like an online ordering thing, which sounds so silly now because you can buy anything online, but at that time we didn't. And we, um, we did, I think every day, we, every alternate day we'd bake donuts or we'd bake bread and then we would spend all day delivering them. Um, and our team would come in and we'd have to bake like socially distanced. And it, it was difficult, but you have to adapt or you will die. And I truly believe that the money that we made, that sounds arrogant, the money that we turned over or the revenue that we brought in and that time saved us. And that was just from doing online deliveries. And it wasn't heaps of money, but it was enough to start you know, paying the bills. Um, Julia. <laughs> um, and then we came out of lockdown. I finally quit my job at Cleminger and um, we opened our first site in the city, which was Lombard Street. Um, very pregnant. <laughs> uh, we did it because we wanted to increase our distribution of bread and the way to do that is to, I don't know, create more spaces that you can distribute from. Um, and also, secretly, the, uh, the kitchen at Pickle and Pie was too small. It was too small from day one. And out the back of dough, there is an extension on the kitchen. So it was kind of like a, yes, a good revenue thing, but also a good logistical thing for the kitchen. Um, we spent some time with Deloitte, um, who we kind of left our small business accounting man and we said, okay, let, we've got to get serious about this. So we signed up with Deloitte and they said, you know, we worked on a strategy together and they said, all right, what we need to do is more, we call it the hub and spoke uh, model, like one central production kitchen and lots of little um, takeaway stores. Also because we were kind of like in and out of COVID at the time, it meant that if we just had takeaway stores, it was like slightly less risk and yeah. Um, so we tried to increase our distribution. We often opened on Lampton Quay. Um, we also took a space at the Brewtown Farmers Market where I would take our little baby and I'd sell the bread and do the things. And um, that market has evolved hugely. It's amazing. If you haven't been, you should go. Um, and then just last year, 2023, we opened HQ. And the reason this is out in Upper Hutt, <laughs> I, was, I was bagging Upper Hutt and yet now we have like <laughs> two spaces and a food truck out there. Um, and we were growing out of our kitchen at the back of the city gallery. And we had, you know, we'd said we're going to do this hub and spoke wheel um, model. So we needed our own like kind of like hub. And I'm super proud of HQ because it's a place where our team have <laughs> lockers. There's a staff room where you, you know, can eat your lunch. There's natural light. And all of these things sound so basic, but actually they're overlooked in hospitality. And we have this goal to like really not reinvent, but you know, um, just put hospitality on the map for being like a great industry to work for. And you can't expect people to bring their A game if you're not providing the basics. So we opened HQ, it's, it's actually huge, but um, that photo doesn't do it justice. And it's got like a little retail shop, this one here, up the side to sell all the bread, um, the coffee and the treats. And that was in March. And 2023 was by far the hardest year yet. And that was, that was just last year and we saw many hospitality businesses folding. Um, some of, you know, people that have been around a, a long time had to close because COVID was difficult, <clears throat> but it was not so bad because the government was like, don't worry, don't pay your tax yet. Um, here's some money for your staff. And you're like, okay, sweet. And so like, you're surviving, you're surviving. And then 2023, they ring up and they're like, hey, you know that tax? <laughs> it's on due now. They're like, okay, um, how much? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, like it was so stressful. And then we invested all this money into HQ. Um, 
which we had to do because we had to build and we had to grow or rise or whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, to get through last year um, was, a, was a struggle, but we did it. And then you may recognize this little food truck from um, previous uh, <laughs> Wall's Pickle and Pie. And then we thought, why? It's so random having this little pickle and pie food truck out in Upper Hutt. So we rebranded it to Dough, the Donut Wagon. Um, so now we have five dough bakery sites and one pickle and pie. Uh, and that's where we're at. That's the story and I've got a little bit of like, I guess, advice. Does anyone have any questions on the story? No? Okay. I have a question. Oh, yes? I want to know what happened to that construction worker who was employed. <laughs> <laughs> she was actually fine in the end, yeah. Eventually she left, but um, not not for bad things or anything. And she turned out she turned out fine. I mean, hospitality is not. It's very helpful if you have knowledge when you're setting something up because you know, like this is the easiest way to run things, the most efficient way. You know, whatever. This is how I would divide a restaurant into sections or whatnot. Um, but it's not imperative that people have experience you know like for a front of house manager I would I would hope that you'd at least made a coffee or two but um, <laughs> yes we now actually have a wonderful venue manager who's Julia over there with the pink hair <laughs> um, she runs pickle and pie and has plenty of experience and is wonderful um, but yeah I do, and there was there was nothing and me saying that about her that was nothing personal about her it was just the fact that I was told by our business partners, let go, don't worry, we'll take care of everything. And then, like, what, why? I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have let go in that situation. Um, so lessons learned over the last six years, save some goddamn money. And this goes back to my first point about um, bite off more than you can chew and chew like fuck. Like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're only in hospitality or in any business, like I'll use the rain analogy because it's l literally like what happens is you're only one, like one week away from a rainy Monday in Wellington. Do people go out on a rainy Monday in Wellington? No. And what happens when you have 10 in a row? And like, guess what happened in November, folks? It rained like, not just Mondays, but Saturdays. And that will kill, that will kill your business if you have no money in the bank because you still have to pay your team, you still have to pay your suppliers. And you know, when we were younger, we would just be like, yeah, invest it, buy this, do that, whatever. The, the bank won't care, but they do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the people you hire will make or break you, hire slow, fire fast, and get a very good HR company on board. Um, we have 58 team now, and they are like family to us. And that doesn't mean we haven't had some bad eggs. And they, I mean, it's not rocket science. Everybody knows that you spend so much time building up your brand and your business, and then it takes one bad human to give a bad experience. And that person, the customer just doesn't come back. In Wellington, they just don't forget that that one time back in 10 years ago, they went in there and their coffee was bad and the person was rude, and they just don't come back. So. Um, I guess it's harder now that there's me and Tim and we have six places and we can only be in one place at one time. I'm doing this and he's dropping our boy at preschool and <laughs> it's like right now all of our places are reliant on the people in them. Adapt or die, but also stop, think and plan because the wallpaper might haunt you forever. Um, <laughs> we had to adapt when we were in COVID, like many businesses did, I'm so glad that we were like, quick, quick, let's do online deliveries or whatever. Um, but also we knew that the bums on seat model and the cafes aren't, that's so hard to make any money out of running a cafe. So we were like, let's do the takeaway thing. I wish I'd known when we first started Do the cafe, that um, we were planning for like multiple sites because then I would have done everything differently. like. We've kind of like, the look and feel is the same everywhere you go and I really hate the wallpaper. But because I'm, like my experience in branding says keep the visual cues the same throughout, 
I'm like, we'll just keep the bloody wallpaper. Um, <clears throat> no, two more. Hire experts to do the things you're not good at and save your time and energy for the things you excel in. Uh, Tim like fixes pipes and like <laughs> I do payroll and just like we do all these jobs, these random jobs, but we're, we shouldn't because if you cost yourself out as like, I don't know, I'm worth like $200 an hour or whatever, I could just hire a plumber to do that for much cheaper um, <laughs> or I could hire a payroll person and because for the last, honestly, for the last six years I've spent so much time doing random jobs that I'm actually not very good at. I've done sweet FA in marketing or branding or whatever and if I just concentrate on that then maybe we would have grown a bit faster. Um, and then lastly, practice what you preach and this is such an old saying but I didn't leave my job at Cleminger for a long time because there is this um, perception in the industry of hospitality that you know, it's a bit of a dead-end job or it's a, you know, you, you, you want to be proud to tell your parents that you work in hospitality. And in New Zealand, it, unfortunately, it's just, it's not there yet. And I was always jealous of Tim because he was a chef and he could work in our businesses. And I had this marketing degree, so I had to stay at work because that's what I'd chosen to do. And, and you know, we're trying to acquire talent into the industry. And here I was not even wanting a bar of it myself. Well, I did want a bar, but I didn't feel like it was, I could. And um, we, Tim was like, we're just, we've got to do it. You know, you love hospitality. You want to bring good, talented people in. And so just do it, just get in there. And that's the same thing when we opened up Doe and Upper Hut. And I was like, no, no, Upper Hut. It's like, <laughs> it's like well, actually, if we want to change things for the, for the way that we want to see it, then we've just got to get in and do it. Um, and and that is that is us. Yeah, I've, we we rose a bit. We rose. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So I have to take questions, or yeah, we had a little bit of time left. Does anyone have any questions for me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Okay, that's fine. I have a question. Oh, 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 oh hello. Um, how do you find time within, because I'm sure you have so many things in a given day managing so many businesses, how do you carve out time to like be creative and think about the new business stuff? Um, I shower twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. In the shower, is that what you said? That's like no. uh, shower, driving. Okay. Um, or sometimes you just got a time block. Like this year, because of the chaos of last year, um, and we didn't want to do that again, and with a baby on the way, we were like, we're going to do some planning. So Tim and I sat down for a good week, and we like planned all of our financials and when we're going to do things. Um, and then, yeah, you kind of write yourself little briefs. Well, I do, because I'm a bit weird like that. Um, mentally, of like, oh, what are we going to do for... Easter, you know, what's our hot, what are our hot cross buns going to look like? And then I just like have to go away and think a little bit. Yeah. Um, and like finding spaces in between to just, yeah. Yeah, cool. and you, you get better at time blocking. Cool. Yeah, even if you have to put like a time in your calendar or, um, yeah. Cool. yeah. I used to do, put the baby to bed at seven and then try and work, but um, now that I'm pregnant again, I like, I just want to go to sleep at seven. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> Can't sleep all the time. Cool. Okay. Oh, hello. Yes, and it actually annoys me a little bit because what we wanted to do is not what the people want. And so, <laughs> um, and you try and like nudge away from what the people want and, and, they'll, and they'll catch up and you know, they'll, they'll like what you like. But um, no, you have, to, you have to give them what they want. Yes, best sellers. I mean, I never thought donuts would be such a hit. Like when we first started dough, we were doing, it was predominantly bread and then nice, like more elegant sweet treats, um, but then people just wanted donuts. And actually, <laughs> top secret, um, 
we're now focusing on like, okay, we're going to have to stop doing donuts soon because the trend will die and we don't want to die with the trend. So what's the next thing? And so we're getting our pastry chefs on board to like ideate on that. And same with pickle and pie. I thought everyone would love pumpkin pie. <laughs> Nobody loves pumpkin pie. <laughs> Is it just because they have to Oh, good, thank you. Come on. It's very good. It's, it's very good. Cool. Yeah, hello. Yes. Yes. Is touring like bus an important door way that you must go through to be able to say that? Absolutely. Or is there lessons that you can actually say to less like bus? <laughs> Chew slowly <laughs> and digest. Yeah. Um, like, no, I'm. We, Tim and I, are firm believers that you need to get off your ass and work. And um, we, my little brother has a business right now and yesterday he was at my mum's house sleeping on the couch at 3 p.m. and I was like, get off your ass because it doesn't, I don't know, maybe it does come easily for some people. Maybe if you're an investment or finance or something, it's, you don't have to work as hard, I'm not sure. But um, I think you, you do have to do that and you have to go through, I don't know, why wouldn't you? You've got your money and your your energy on the line, so just do it. But don't do it forever, because <laughs> you can't. And maybe the chew like fuck thing was like more of a financial thing, like don't, oh sorry, bite off your, more than you can chew, don't, don't just over invest in things and end up with all the debt and the interest. And Hello? Hi, it just sounds like you and Tim got an amazing team and you work really well together. We do, and I'm actually very upset that he's not here. <laughs> um, <laughs> We do. We are a great team. Um, we weren't married when we started this, um, and now we could never get a divorce because it would be a real mess. <laughs> <laughs> but he, and we know what we're good at. You know, I can't cook. I, I, I don't because I, I don't have to, but um, he does all the cooking. He leaves any, like, anything remotely creative to me. Um, and then, yeah, we just bounce off each other. We trust each other. Um, and we would never, or I especially, would never get another business partner because I've been burnt and I don't, like, maybe do it, I don't know, but they didn't contribute much to us, so find, find a human that you work well with and, and go far. Oh, hello. <laughs> Doesn't anyone have to go to work? Okay. <laughs> Julia does. <laughs> I'm kidding. You can be late. So you know, you know yeah, what yeah. it's like. I remember, I remember how life-changing it was when the little pickle and pie cup opened. It was like so good. And even For you and I both, food. thank you. <laughs> but it's like I took a friend the other day out to Upper Hutt and we went to go. He's like, oh, I thought you said Upper Hutt was shit. Like, I think we said it. So I was like, yeah, this is the one good place. <laughs> but like, I guess what you were talking about, like bringing stuff in and bringing that to Upper Hutt because it is an amazing place. Do you see any changes coming for Upper Hutt? Is like, are yes. you guys lifting things up? Or is yes. Um, yes, in, in a few ways. So um, I'm actually on, I've been asked to be part of the city planning for the next 30 years or something. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> like we don't, I don't have to be part of it for 30 years. They're planning 30 years in advance to like try and make the city centre, bring Brewtown and the, and the city together. Um, so I see a lot of vision and change there. Um, they want to change, they're just really slow and bureaucratic. Um, but I do see more things moving out there, probably more so in Wellington City, actually. Um, and I think, watch the space, it is going to get better. Yeah. And <laughs> do you think your attitude to Upper Hutt will ever change? Yes, and it, it does. And I think, I, I think I was just such an immature asshole for thinking <laughs> that it was. I, I don't know, like, I, I don't know I why I didn't <laughs> love it. I think it's got a bad name and I've grown up my whole life with people going, oh, you're from there, and so then I adopted that attitude. But it's, um, it's not a bad place to be. It's actually quite beautiful. <laughs> There's lots of trees and things. And now we, um, <laughs> have, we hire, hire, we have, like, our team is building, building. We've actually moved people from the city out to Upper Hutt to work at HQ, and I think that's really, that's cool. There's proper careers and growth out there now.
and, and hospital anyway, and a, and a few other industries. Cool. Go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who's also from Upper Hutt. <laughs> I knew that though, because <laughs> you came to the club. I know, I did. It was so good. If you ever want to do a bread making workshop, um, hit these guys up. Really yes. awesome fun. I was like, I'm going to not be a designer anymore, I'm going to become a baker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, but we'll get there.